Hey everyone, Steve here with Phantom History. Thanks so much for checking us out on YouTube, and if you enjoy our content, make sure you subscribe. I also wanted to remind you that Patreon subscribers get access to bonus content, and we have a newsletter that you can subscribe to that will let you know when a new episode drops and when that new bonus content is available. Enjoy this episode. As he escorted the paranormal investigators through the historic home, Michael was amused by the gadgetry and techniques of the team. Never one to consider himself a believer in the supernatural, he always enjoyed the intensity the investigators showed in their work and their excitement over every EMF spike or possible paranormal phenomena caught on camera. But Michael's amusement and fascination turned into surprise during one such investigation at the House of Refuge in Southeast Florida. While exploring one of the rooms, one investigator invited an unseen entity in an empty space to say hello to Michael, who was the keeper of the house. It was then that a voice from the spirit box very clearly said, Hello, Michael. And that altered the way he looked at the spirits, or as he calls them, memories, still echoing through the structure originally built to save survivors of shipwrecks. I'm Steve Blanchard. Welcome to Phantom History. The southeast coast of Florida is called the Treasure Coast, and for good reason. The number of shipwrecks hidden beneath the waves entice adventurers and explorers to search the battered hulls of discovered ships for a bounty of historic and archaeological discoveries. The unforgiving waves of the Atlantic Ocean and difficult weather made the area treacherous, especially before the advent of radar and weather forecasting technology. That's why, in 1876, the United States Life Saving Service commissioned a string of beachfront structures along Florida's Atlantic coastline to serve as houses of refuge. These life-saving stations employed keepers and their families, whose responsibility was to literally offer refuge to those who survived shipwrecks. Today's keeper of the house, Michael Phillips, explains how that operation worked. The life-saving service in the 1870s um, was trying to provide food, clothing, and shelter for shipwrecked survivors. When they got to Florida, because of the lack of population, they had to rethink their program. So instead of having a life-saving station, they had a house on the beach in the middle of nowhere with one guy in it. His job, food, clothing, shelter for shipwrecked survivors, involved walking basically 30 miles of beach. So if he sees a storm coming, he gets his gear together and he starts. And each house is 30 miles apart. So he's going to go 15 north, 15 south. Of course, this takes a couple of days because everything was either done on the water or on foot. Serving as a keeper of the house was a 24-7 job. Often, shipwreck survivors would make their way to the front door of the house, covered in tattered clothing and bleeding, to ask for help. The House of Refuge in Martin County is the only surviving one of its kind and serves as a museum to honor the keepers who rescued countless lives along the Treasure Coast. Brian Jackson, assistant keeper of the house today, says the building's preservation is due to a number of factors, namely location, sturdy construction, and honestly, a bit of luck. This house is the oldest structure in Martin County. Uh, it's built in 1875. It was the second one built out of 10. And there's not, you know, the, the other house has been um, abandoned, knocked down, condos built, you name it. This, is, this one is the one and only left. And one of the, a couple reasons why is it sits on a rock formation called Anastasia Rock. Out, it, the house actually sits right on top of the rock. Uh, and it's also built out of Dade County Pine, which is uh, not conducive to termites, which is a good thing. And it can uh, persevere through the salt climate because we basically have about 40 yards between the Indian River Lagoon and the Atlantic Ocean. So it, it's a really treacherous, spot to have a building, but it has persevered uh, for many, many years. 
Other houses of refuge became victims of time and changing attitudes toward how Florida's coastline should be patrolled. Michael shares what happened to the rest of those buildings along the coast meant to offer refuge to shipwreck survivors. What happened to the rest of them was, at the end of World War II, during World War II, all houses of refuge were naval observation stations. At the end of the war, the Navy decommissioned them and put them up for sale. Well, all of them sold, except this one. They actually abandoned it. They packed their trash and walked away. And it sat abandoned for about eight years. The abandoned building was occupied by squatters until 1953, when Martin County purchased it and 16 and a half acres for less than $500. Today, the museum welcomes visitors from across the state and country. And while the House of Refuge is an educational and peaceful place, both Michael and Brian say that there may be something else still lingering in the building that occasionally makes itself known. Brian says that he has never had any kind of paranormal experience before taking on his role at the House of Refuge in 2019. But since then, he has experienced phenomena that he can't quite explain, and he says they may have made him more open to the possibility of paranormal causes. I have heard a soothing woman's voice from a couple times. It was a Brian and a fade out but it was very soothing to me. It was, it, was, it was welcoming. As soon as I opened the door to come out of the, this end of the museum, I heard of uh, just a, a Brian and, a, and a, just a very soothing female voice, Brian, like that. And I was like, was that Mike from up top? Because the wind shifts here. Like you, you can, the people fish on the dock and when the wind's blowing east towards you, it kind of comes to you like, so I thought maybe that. And I was oh, like, like, Mike, <laughs> first off, were you downstairs? He's like, no. I said, secondly, did you call, did you just call me about 10, you know, five minutes, with however long ago? And he said, no. Both Michael and Brian think that the disembodied voice that Brian heard may belong to Susan Bessie who was the wife of Hubert Bessy, the keeper of the house from 1890 to 1901. In fact, several artifacts in the museum are documented to have belonged to her, including some China place settings. But Bryant isn't the only one who has encountered Mrs. Bessy. Paranormal investigators claim to have communicated with her, and Bryant says that a visitor to the museum may have actually seen her. So I'm in the gift shop. You know, we have a gift shop, we have people coming out when it gets busy. Some people uh, wait outside, we have a little sitting area, right? So I took care of a bunch of people. They went into the museum with a volunteer and I'm looking at the window here and I'm, there's a guy like, like looking up at the top of the house up here, which is the bunk. Kind of, remember I said in the same area as where I've seen everything actually, or heard, experienced, whatever. And, and I walked out, I thought there was something wrong with the guy. I'm like, you, you, you okay? And he said, dude, there's a ghost in that house, and it's a woman. And he said, on my grave, I've seen her, something like that. And he kept staring up at here. He kept staring like this. I couldn't even, I'm talking to him, and he's staring up there as I'm having this conversation with him. <laughs> he, didn't even, he didn't even come in the museum, by the way. He just came into that little waiting area and looked up. We had a conversation and he left. He didn't come into the museum. For Michael, who has been a keeper of the house for a decade, paranormal experiences are rare. For years, he has heard about possible spirits and entities in the house and has even felt a cold spot in the building. But as a self-described skeptic, he admits he often has doubt when people share stories of unexplained encounters. That was until he says he saw someone, or something, that he believes belongs to a different time. We have a boathouse, the main house, and what we call the quarters. It was built during World War II for the one officer who was here. Well, anyway, 
that's our classroom. And I'm coming out of the quarters to go into the house. We're not open. And I walk out and there's a man standing on the porch. There's two steps to the porch. I mean, you know, one step, boom, you're on the porch. When I got to the top step to ask him who he was, he wasn't there. And I just, I literally stood there and thought, you finally saw it. That very same day, I'm standing in the doorway and I see the same guy walk across the patio. And when he gets to the end of the patio, he's not there anymore. Wow. Now, I don't see him disappear. He's just not there. One of the gals that worked here who did special events, she and I were here one night. It was like after the world's longest wedding reception. And we're cleaning up. And I am literally standing in the doorway of the house, and she's on the porch. And she goes, Michael, who just walked through the house? And I lean in and I look down the hallway. And I said, there's nobody in here, Erica. She said, somebody walked in front of the window. And I was like, well, there isn't anybody in the house. She said, I'm never coming out here after dark again. Keepers, their families, and those to whom they offered refuge were living in a frontier environment that was vastly untouched by modern conveniences. Cholera and other illnesses were common, as were encounters with Florida's native wildlife. Shipwrecks would occur literally right offshore, and often the bodies of those who did not survive were never recovered. So narrowing down the supposed spirits that are still within the House of Refuge is a difficult task. But Brian and Michael both know one thing for sure. Whatever is still in the building with them means them no harm. Neither man has ever felt threatened by the unseen presence looking over their shoulders while they work. I just felt that there was a presence within the room. Now, whether they were watching me, I would more say like they were alongside me, not necessarily watching me. And then I start to think about that. I'm like, okay, so maybe it was the keeper and he's still up there or, or you know, and, and he's almost like trying to communicate to fellow keeper kind of thing. I know that sounds weird, but I, I, I wouldn't say looking at me. I would say alongside me. While Brian feels like he is working alongside those who came before him, he takes comfort in feeling that his predecessors approve of the job he's doing. Michael says he also feels a sense of accomplishment when he rearranges artifacts or reorganizes a room, which he likes to think is the spirit's way of telling him that they are pleased with his work. But Michael may have had the best compliment from a former resident of the home during a recent paranormal investigation. During the paranormal investigations, several times, the paranormals will be talking to Mrs. Bessie, who usually gives her approval of me. The last one we did, I'm standing there, and this gal's got those rods swing back and forth, and she's in tune with Mrs. Bessie, who is obviously right there, and do you like my beard? And these things are swinging back and forth and this paranormal, paranormal investigator saying, oh yeah, she likes this, she likes that. And I'm like, is this for real? Michael, remember, is a skeptic. He admits experiences like the divining rods fascinate and even entertain him. And he has no doubt that those who investigate the House of Refuge believe that they are communicating with something that he cannot see. But there was one specific incident during a paranormal investigation that made Michael question his own skepticism. One of these psychics is talking to this empty room, the dining room, and says, if you're in here, say hello to Mike. And the guy next to me is holding this radio and it goes, hello, Michael. <laughs> and I went, where did that come from? And this guy's got this, his eyes look like a little orphan Annie. He's like, oh my God, that came out of here. The House of Refuge in Martin County and the Keeper's families that operated it were heroic. By living in isolation and readily patrolling the shores before, during, and after major storms, the Keeper saved lives and offered hope to those battling rough seas. 
But just how often would a keeper of a house of refuge host survivors of Atlantic Coast shipwrecks? Well, that's hard to say, according to Michael. We had one keeper who was here for 10 years and never had to deal with the shipwreck. So it's not, there, there is no average. The right. keeper that followed him had two in 24 hours. But I can tell you in this house, over the time that it was a house of refuge, 1876, 1915, they took in 44 survivors. So multiply that times 10 yeah. and, and think, remember we're in the wilderness, we're not Charleston, South Carolina, we're nowhere. That's a pretty goodly number. With so many stories of shipwreck survivors, heroic rescues, wilderness living, and kind families offering food and shelter to those who needed it the most, it's no wonder that the House of Refuge in Martin County has such a compelling attraction for so many people, whether they are paranormal investigators or simply interested in Florida history. The county's oldest standing structure and only surviving House of Refuge tells a story of life in the 19th century that seems almost foreign by today's standards. A museum can tell a story and even give hands-on interactions with relics from a bygone era. But is the House of Refuge actually haunted? Well, that seems to be a question every visitor has for Michael. Everybody who walks through this place, if I'm doing the, the, the tour or the lecture, is it haunted? Define haunted, you know? I mean, there are people been living here for 4,000 years because before the House of Refuge, there was a Native American tribe. I prefer to think it has a real good memory. And sometimes it'll share its memory with you. Phantom History is researched, written, and produced by me, Steve Blanchard. Special thanks to Michael Phillips and Brian Jackson of the House of Refuge in Martin County for participating in this episode. To hear the full interview with both the Keeper and the Assistant Keeper, visit phantomhistory.com or the Phantom History YouTube channel. For even more information on the House of Refuge, including hours of operation, visit the Historical Society of Martin County webpage at hsmc-fl.com. Music for this episode was provided by Chad Crouch and Shane Ivers of Silverman Sound. And please consider leaving a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you use. As always, thank you for listening. Hey, Steve here. Thanks so much for checking out that content. And before you go, I wanted to let you know that if you become a supporter of the podcast through Patreon, you'll gain access to bonus content. And if you subscribe to our newsletter at phantomhistory.com, we will let you know when that bonus content becomes available and when a new episode drops. And one more thing, I'm always looking for ideas for future episodes. So if you have an experience or a location you think that I should focus on, please let me know through the website or you can email me directly at podcast at phantomhistory.com.